Hi, Dr. Eric. Welcome to KGL TV. Good morning, Reverend Kelly. Thank you for having me. It's so nice to see you today. It's very cold up here in Canada, and we had a big snowstorm, and our Wi-Fi is a little bit funny. But I wonder how you're doing there because you're not even in the same country. Where are you coming to me from? Coming from the great state of Oklahoma, oh, wow. kind of right in the middle of uh, the United States. It's not near as cold there as it is here, or not near as cold here as it is up there, I'm sure, right now. Yeah. <laughs> but do you get snow? Do you get snow when it's winter time? It's kind of hit and miss. I mean, we don't get a lot of snow usually, but oh. when, sometimes, uh, like last, last winter, we had a major winter storm, and it got down to like minus, I think it was minus 13 Fahrenheit, and I think like about... 10 or 11 inches of snow, but that, that's a huge amount for yeah. us. Yeah. I mean, that may not be anything for Canada. <laughs> but for you, it would be because you don't often put your furnace on. So your pipes would crack and things would happen and traffic jams and people would be sledding on, you know, sidewalks and stuff. <laughs> I'm picturing it. <laughs> that would be fun. That would be fun. Well, it's so nice to have you join us. Uh, I'm very pleased to meet you. This is the second time I've seen you virtually. And I mm -hmm. thank you because last week you came and were our special surprise guest. You came at the very end of our uh, virtual event on mental health. And we thank you so much for doing that, Dr. Eric. You came at the last minute. Thank you. <laughs> well, I appreciated the, the uh, chance to be there. It was quite an interesting topic and, you know, very timely, especially in the times that we're living in right now. So it's a, it's a struggle right now. A lot of people are having difficulties with mental wellness. Now I had shared uh, the event with our friends at Hoi Poloi earlier in the week, and they said, you need to meet Dr. Eric. And I said, okay, I need to meet Dr. Eric. So <laughs> I was so uh, glad to be doing is you are combining pharmacy with cannabis and i find that so very interesting you speak a lot about mental wellness and mental health for that uh, you've talked a lot about coming off of pharmaceuticals using cannabis interactions for that dr eric tell us a little bit about where you came from what you came to this for and why multifactorial wow. but I'll, I'll kind of uh, just kind of explain it uh it has to do with a whole bunch of different things. Um, you know, a lot of times when, um, especially as we age, people are, are put on more and more uh, pharmaceutical meds. And a lot of times what happens is, you know, once you get above about five med medications, a lot of times that increases the, the risk for drug interactions and side effects. And a lot of times once you get past that five, you're just when you add medication and additional medication on you're just using it to cover up side effects of the other medication so it's like a kind of like a snowball rolling downhill or something you know it just keeps adding and adding and getting bigger and bigger and then eventually you find yourself on you know 12 13 meds and i mean they preach in pharmacy school not to you know that's what's called polypharmacy and that could be very very dangerous and kind of where i i really started getting interested in the space was uh you know i i joined a couple of different organizations that uh, that deal with cannabis as from a medical perspective i'm in, in an organization called international society of cannabis pharmacists and i'm in a uh, organization called so uh, society of cannabis uh clinicians and they provide excellent education and stuff and it's just hearing the the doctors the individual doctors stories about how they've taken patients from you know very poor health multiple medications and stuff to and substitute cannabinoid based therapy you you're able a lot of times to get people off a lot of those medications and lead a better quality of life. And, you know, that's kind of what uh, I got into pharmacy for is to help people and to help people lead a better quality of life. My, my background, I mean, I've been a hospital pharmacist for over 30 years. And, uh, you know, I've seen some of the good that can, that can, in the healthcare system. I've seen some of the, the shortcomings of the healthcare system. And, 
another reason I kind of got into into this, but was because of the opioid epidemic. Just to be honest with you, I mean, it is so prevalent down here in the states. We had we had ninety three thousand people die from a drug overdoses last last year in the United States, oh and two thirds of those were um, opioid related. Oh my god! And you know, a lot of times those prescription or those people that are dying, you know, they may not be dying necessarily from, from pills, but I mean, they can't, they can be dying from, you know, taking uh, oral opioids. But what a lot of times what happens is, you know, they, they just keep being on pills and stuff for such a long time. Right. And then maybe for some reason they start, crossing the line to abuse and they, they get cut off and then they go to street drugs. Oh, yes. Like, you know, heroin. And a lot of that is laced with uh, fentanyl, to be yes. honest. Fentanyl is one of the most potent narcotics out there. Yeah. And I, I mean, it's very humbling to know that somebody, uh, somebody could have died from originally from a prescription that may have that their addiction may have originated from a place where I may have actually dispensed an opioid prescription to, to them. And, you know, I think just kind of eventually rolled out of control for them. And that's something I had a very hard time dealing with. And this, this whole, the whole dope sick, I don't know if you, you guys have, you have probably have Hulu in Canada, but I just finished watching the series last night. I had already read the book. And I found myself getting very, very angry at um, the the family uh, that uh, produced the drug OxyContin. Yeah. I mean, the, the guy played a, a great villain in that in that show. Richard Sackler did, and it just really made me it really made me hate the guy. To be honest with yeah. you, yeah. Realize, you know that. You know, when I when I got into pharmacy school and stuff, I thought, you know, it was all about curing people and, you know, making things, people better and stuff. But, you know, sometimes greed and money and stuff gets in the way of it, too. And that's something that just really I didn't like. So. Oh, my goodness. Everything you've just said. I've had goosebumps from the top of my head right down. The thing that I heard was substitution cannabinoid therapy. I love that term. I love that you shared that with us. And polypharmacy. But by polypharmacy, I know people that have said that they have been on 22 medications, 22 pills a day, one on one after the other. This is interacting. This is interacting. And they've been given 22 pills, which they are required to take every single day. But now they only use cannabis. Do you believe that? Um, I've, I've heard of such stories and depending upon what the medications are, yes, I do believe that because yeah. cannabis can be used as a substitute, your cannabis or cannabinoids, you know, can be used as a substitute for, you know, pain, pain medicine, pain medication, anxiety. There are some, uh, some people that use it for depression, yeah. muscle spasms, tons of different stuff, you know, because like. Like I said, you know, cannabis and cannabinoids don't just work at one single spot. You know, it's a plant that has numerous compounds in it and is able to work throughout the body. And kind of what, what cannabis role is, is in the endocannabinoid system, it's just, it's kind of the, the master regulatory system of all the other ones. It kind of, kind of helps to maintain balance or what, what is, we call homeostasis, which means balance. Yes. But, kind of maintains, maintains balance throughout all the other systems. And right. the real crime is that, you know, because of cannabis prohibition and stuff, there are very few in the medical profession that, uh, that even have been introduced to the endocannabinoid system. And right. that's something that's really got to change as people go gravitate more and more towards, you know, different types of therapies. And as a pharmacist, I've got... I think it's very important that I understand these types of therapies. And thank you for that because not a lot of medical practitioners are even looking into it. 
I know cannabis educators right now that are walking into universities and teaching medical students about the ECS for the first time ever. Four right. or five year medical students, and they've never heard of the endocannabinoid system. It was discovered in the 1990s. Right. What is going on here? But thank you because you decided to investigate it a little bit further when you heard about all of the different cannabinoids and terpenes and the profile. This plant has so much, so much that hasn't even been discovered yet. So much that hasn't even been researched because it was taken from us for so long. That sucks. But we have people like yourself and myself and other educators and medical practitioners that are saying, hello, we can help you. We can help you. So, Dr. Eric, what was it? You said it was not even years ago that you were interested in cannabis. Now you are. What was that that first big moment, that aha moment where you went, "Okay, I think I better learn a little bit more about this? It really, a lot of it had to do with, uh, you know, in 2018 is when Oklahoma legalized medical cannabis here. Yes. And, you know, we had, we had had some, uh, some CBD stores and stuff for around, around for a while, you know, after the, you know, that became legal, you know, with the, the farm bill and stuff here in the United States. And, yeah. you know, some of those places were already positioned some of those places that were CBD plus the next day were CBD plus slash Lotus Gold, which is is their cannabis brand name down here. The next day, it, it was almost like they were anticipating the, uh, you know, the legalization. And right. Oklahoma is, I believe, number one in the nation per capita as far as uh, number of dispensaries. At last look, I did a, a presentation for. International Society of Cannabis Pharmacists in May, and I believe at that time we had 2,200 dispensaries in a uh, state of about four million people. Wow! Wow, so, that's, I mean, that's actually great news. <laughs> Your Oklahoma is going to get so much healthier. <laughs> we yeah, we have a ton of them, and it, I guess it's it's good in a way, and it's uh, you know it's bad in a way. You know we're uh, there's almost too much competition. Yeah. So a it's lot happening of here in Canada too. They keep licensing store after store after store. And I keep saying, Oh, that's good. That's good. More than liquor, more than liquor stores, more than beer stores. But everybody else is going, no, that's a little too much, but <laughs> we're <laughs> celebrating. We're yeah. celebrating all of the stores. So you said that you wanted to maybe give some more education because there were so many stores and not enough knowledge about it. Correct. Okay. And I mean, I had I had some difficulty locating it to be honest with you. Uh, what what I originally did was uh, I think it was June of 2020. I uh, started. Uh, I don't know if you know who Regina Nelson is, but she has a she has a book and she has a website uh, that that has training for like technicians and stuff or not technicians. Uh, bud tenders and stuff about the endocannabinoid system and stuff. And I, I took that and I got all, all through all three levels of it and stuff, but I, I kind of felt like there was a whole lot I was still missing. Sure. So that's when I, uh, you know, I looked at uh, international society of cannabis pharmacists and they had a, they had a whole training program. A whole, it was like 16 hours of continuing education on just, cannabis, different disease states, you know, how the different cannabinoids work and stuff. And it's like, this, this is something that has been missing from the healthcare system for such a long time. And I just felt really excited about it. You know, like I've been a ph hospital pharmacist for 30 years and, you know, I've seen a ton of stuff and honestly, I needed a little, little bit of a change. Yes. So once I started learning this about this and stuff, I realized, you know, my desire is more to help individual patients to get better. And I just wanted to to be able to open a practice. My my uh, website is called Illum Cannabis Wellness you. and, you know, talk to uh, different people about, you know, if cannabinoid based therapy is right for them and. If so, how do we go, go about incorporating that into your uh, regimen? And then if need be, how can we talk to your physician about 
trying to get you weaned on weaned back off of some of these pharmaceuticals and or you know if not we can't get you off of them maybe we can lower the dose you know say i have a chronic pain patient or something who's on a lot maybe let's just say 80 milligrams of oxycodone a day you know 40 milligrams twice a day you you can a lot of times you can you can reduce that by 50 percent fairly quickly and it still achieve the same uh pain control just by using low dose cannabinoid there are thc to kind of help that opioid work better okay and it, you, when you do that you reduce reduce the risk of you know a lot of the adverse effects that you get with opioids like you know slowing down your breathing slowing down your heart rate and stuff because THC, there, there aren't any CB1 receptors in the brainstem where that that process is controlled. So you can safely add cannabis on and reduce the opioid, opioid. And I just felt that was, you know, especially in today's climate and, you know, the op opioid epidemic and stuff, that was just so important. And it's it's hard to get people who maybe the lawmakers and stuff to understand the medical side. A lot of them, especially from my conservative state of Oklahoma, sure. only look at cannabis as a gateway drug or a drug of abuse. And, you know, you're throwing out the whole plant because of one, can, one, a two, or a couple cannabinoids. You know, there's more than THCVs active too, but, yeah. uh, you know, just because of some that are, that have, psychological or you know can, can make you yeah that's, that's yeah. what i'm looking for yeah. <laughs> from yeah. these intoxicating you know, intoxicating right. and they don't right. want that and they say oh no that's too scary we can't have that and with reefer madness it's so bad for you but really our body needs that it's literally requiring it it's it's looking for it the signals are saying please give me cannabinoids please help me balance right now what i really right. love about you too is that you say it's okay to still have some pharmaceuticals if you need it. If you need right. that right now, if your body, if there's something, and we know a lot of these adults that have been on medications for a long time, it's changed their brain. They may need some chemical interaction up there because their brains are suffering. So if there's a way to have that, a little bit of that, and then the cannabis filling it in there, that might be better for them. Would you think? Yeah, I, I do. I do. And, you know, uh, there's a lot of different diseases and stuff that, you know, scream out for cannabinoid based therapy. Uh, yes. ma many of them are there. There's several I can think of off the top of my head. In fact, I just went to a, a presentation last night on uh, autism and autism is is at least partially caused by a. Uh, an imbalance in the uh, in the body's own uh, chemical called anandamide, which is an endocannabinoid, you know that uh, you know that occurs naturally in the body. So it only makes sense if you replace the deficient cannabinoids with cannabinoids from plants that it's going to you know drive that system back into balance and stuff. And it was just amazing and very. Um, very, very heartwarming. Yes. To see some of the changes in these kids. Absolutely. And that's where the heart is the children. Watching the children be able to thrive and grow, knowing that if they had not had this plant, they may not have ever been able to thrive this way. I am so glad that you see that. I am so thankful that you're able to share that with us. More people need to hear this and see this, especially from medical professionals as yourself, taking the time to change your career, to fight for this plant's message. Dr. Eric, you are a spokesperson for this plant that has no voice. And I thank you for that. That is incredible. And that is wonderful. And your message needs to be heard. Bravo to you, my friend. Thank you. Well, thank you, Reverend Kelly. I, I do appreciate you helping me get, you know, the message out. You know, a lot of people don't don't really understand cannabinoid based therapy and still look at it as, you know, a, a drug abuse type thing. But it's not that at all or it doesn't have to be. You know what I'm saying? Uh, 
you know, we just talked about autism as being one of the, the things that a lot of people have uh, cannabinoid deficiencies in, in and, uh, you know, there's so many more diseases like that. Uh, fibromyalgia is, is one, you know, a lot of, a lot of things that are like hyper inflammatory type diseases, you know, all the cannabinoids are pretty, pretty good anti-inflammatories as well. I mean, they, and a lot of, a lot of diseases that can be affected by inflammation and stuff respond favorably to cannabis as well. Oh, it's so beautiful to hear that. It's so beautiful to hear your take on it. Before I wrap our interview, I want to ask you one question, one okay. last question, your opinion. I want to tell you my theory. I have a theory because our, our plant was taken from us, prohibited for almost 100 years. We have not done all the research. We have not even discovered half of the cannabinoids we will discover eventually over time. My theory is that we add this from birth. So the moment we come off of our breast milk, our mother's breast milk, which is a place that we receive our, our cannabinoids, the moment we come off that, I believe there should be a formula of cannabinoids that we should take into our body to balance us for homeostasis right from birth. What do you think? Do you think that would eradicate all of the diseases and stop all of the problems uh, initially before they start? No, that's a good question. Um, there is is our friend frozen? I'm still here. Are uh -oh. you still there? I know. I'm, I think we're frozen for the very last question. <laughs> <laughs> Are you there? I'm still here. I don't think we're going to get Dr. Eric's answer. <laughs> How funny. The very last question. You know what? You're frozen on the screen. I'm moving. I don't know. Maybe I'm frozen to him. I'm going to, to wrap this interview because we have terrible Wi-Fi. And I'm going to promise that we will come back with Dr. Eric another day for him to answer that question. Sounds Thank great. you, Dr. Eric. If you can hear me, we'll bring you back another day.